Happy Culture na área um pouquinho mais cedo hoje, mas por um motivo especial aí a gente hoje recebe uma das lendas death metal, Mr. Paul Speckman, from Master. Welcome, Paul. Well, hello. How are you? Fine. Miguel Barrote, sejam bem-vindos ao Portugal Connection. Sempre ativa. Tranquilo? Boa noite. Alô, Brasil. Hello. <risos> Hello world. Hello world. Hello world. Uh, nós hoje, hoje estamos, estamos empolgados porque uh, é, é, é do, do gosto geral de, de, de todos nós aqui, o Paul, que enfim, já, já acompanhamos desde os anos 80, uma vez que desde 1983 que o Paul anda nisto. E nós, enfim, a partir dali dos meados e ou ali mais próximo dos final, do final dos anos 80, fomos acompanhando tudo que, o que o Paul fazia. Eu conheci o Paul na música através de Abomination. Foi a banda que me deu a conhecer o Paul Speckman, com aquele primeiro trabalho de Abomination, que foi... Uau! Depois a seguir veio Death, Death Strike, e, e só mais tarde é que, é que acabei por conhecer Master. Uh, Paul, welcome, good evening, and, and welcome to our heavy culture family. Um, we are very excited to have you here. Uh, I was just saying that I met you with Abomination, then oh, went to great. Death Strike, and uh, finally I met your work with Master. Uh, okay. You know, three bands that uh, are biggest, uh, you know, uh, then... Um, I, I can't, I really can't say, um, uh, can, can't find the, the real, uh, the, the real and best adjectives to, to, to say what I feel for your bands, because you are one of the greatest guys in metal. You are very um, communicative. Uh, you are, you know, one of the coolest guys in metal. I have to say that. I'm just Paul, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know. Okay, before we go, we would like to invite people to to go to uh, the right uh, side of the chat to leave any questions for Paul. Uh, if we have time, and I hope so, we can um, go to some of the questions of our viewers. Please feel free to go there and write your questions to Paul. Um, em português, uh, quem quiser fazer perguntas já sabe como é que nós fazemos. E, e uma vez que o Ivan ainda não chegou... Uh, fica o convite para subscreverem o canal, é aquilo que ele diz, dá-nos força, dá-nos mais vontade de continuar a trazer estas lives uh, todas as terças e mais algumas coisas que se vão fazendo, e por isso a casa é vossa e usina, usina e abusem dela, ok? Em uh, inglês, uh, we would like to invite everyone to subscribe the channel and hit the bell to, to know what's going on with heavy culture, and you are most welcome to, you know, give us ideas to go forward and to be better, ok? Uh, vamos à primeira pergunta? Uh, eu vou bater aqui de primeira no, no último lançamento do Master, que foi o live em Athens, ao vivo, né? Limitada a 300 míseras cópias. 300 <risos> cópias. Uh, queria perguntar para o Polo aí se, como é que foi esse trabalho, enfim... E se ainda existe cópia disponível? <laughs> que 300 <laughs> cópias. Vamos a isso. Ok, ok, Paul. First question starts from from the the newest material that you released, uh, the live album Alive in Athens, which was released in 2020, correct? Mm -hmm. And yeah. it was limited to just 300 copies. It's not too much. Uh, yeah. So the first question that uh, JK has is if if that work uh, uh, pleased you, if you if you if you if you liked it, and he has a doubt if there are any copies left to buy. <laughs> oh, actually, there are plenty of copies left in the basement. Okay, I okay. Have good news that. then. Yeah, well, I guess <laughs> I don't know. It's good news, but you know, I'm trying to sell everything all the time, but. There's, uh, I, I probably have 30, 30 LP, uh, double LPs in the basement. They actually didn't sell very well. People weren't interested in oh. it. I, I oh, really don't know why. Uh, okay, I'll be honest with you. I smiled when uh, when I got the recording and stuff. I listened to it, and and uh, it, it, it turns out that the recording came from a cell phone. 
The video is from a cell phone. And a friend of mine in Greece, uh, he, uh, he remixed and remastered it. And, and it actually does sound pretty pretty good. You know? I mean, it's not the greatest live album in history, but, but it does sound pretty good. And uh, actually, uh, when I'm rehearsing for shows, which aren't actually happening now, um, anyway, I'm in the basement, and a lot of times I'm playing to that live album, the CD or whatever, and it's good, good practice for me. Okay, it's kind of crazy playing with the old members in the band. I'll admit that they left the band, but anyways, it's still good practice for me to to uh, play the live show like it is live in the basement. I'm playing the bass and and I'm singing, and uh, I don't have the bass plugged in, but I'm singing, you know, and I've got this. I'm playing with the stereo, the CDs up loud, and and I got a little PA in the basement, so I am singing, but I'm not killing the neighbors with the bass. So it's just kind of <laughs> I'm just going through the motions on the bass and singing. And it's a good good way to practice with this record. But yeah, a lot there's still a lot of copies in the basement. I'm not sure why the record uh, isn't selling. But on the other hand, I have a lot of uh, a lot of re re releases happening all the time. I'm I'm busy. I'm uh, putting out new shirts and reissues and different CDs and different projects. I try to keep moving. It's such a downtime right now. It's yeah. almost two, two years just about since I played shows and. I'm trying to keep myself motivated and busy. And the only way to do that is to put out more merch, try and keep people into the band. And, and that's the only way I can do it, really. Yeah. It's yeah. Maybe, maybe. Press time, you know? <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe COVID is one of the reasons why sales are not so good nowadays. Uh, well, it's, I, it's, I know a lot of people from from labels, and they all have the same problem. They are not selling as much as they used to because maybe people don't don't want to take any chances because they never know what to expect next month if they have a job, if they have money. So, so unfortunately, okay, music it's not the first priority. Okay, but what I <laughs> want to say is, I'm talking about this album particularly. Mm -hmm. For some reason, people aren't buying this double LP. But uh, as for T-shirts and CDs and other vinyl, it's uh, steady. I've, I've had ever since COVID began and everything shut down, I've had more sales at home than I've had in years. Okay. So it's just nice. the opposite for me. You know, I, I do all the, I do everything, the packaging. I go to the post office usually three times a week. I'm uh, I'm sending like uh, let's say thirty packages a week, sometimes fifty in a week. It's I'm doing really well, but for some reason, the record's not doing very well. But okay, maybe after we okay, talk, so somebody, somebody will buy let's, it. Yeah. Let, let's try to help you. Share share the link with us, and we'll post okay. it here live. So maybe we can get some sales for you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> who knows? Yeah, who knows, right? Okay, so... Uh, Ainda há muitas cópias, uh, ele, não sabe, ele não sabe exatamente o porquê, mas uh, este álbum não teve muita aderência, um, apesar de o Covid não ser a justificação para, para as fracas vendas deste álbum em particular, uh, porque tudo o resto que ele tem editado, e tem editado várias coisas, uh, várias reedições, ele vende e está tudo estável, e costuma enviar cerca de 50... Um, 50 pacotes, vamos chamar assim, por semana. Um, portanto, as coisas têm estado a correr bem. Mas não com este álbum. Ele tem imensas cópias na cave onde ele ensaia ao som do álbum, uh, sem o baixo, para não matar os vizinhos, como, como para, para, para traduzir com baixo, à letra. Com o baixo, mas sem, sem, sem a amplificação. Sem, sem som, sem o amp. E, e canta ao som do, do disco e tenho usado o disco para praticar uma vez que os anteriores membros da banda já não estão na banda e ele, e ele assim também ensaia um, o, Paul, o, o Paul álbum é uma das pessoas mais ativas, desculpa interromper Barroto, é uma das pessoas mais ativas em nível de vendas que já vi no, no Facebook, por exemplo ele é, é fantástico porque está constantemente e também no, no Instagram ele está constantemente a, a promover o, aquilo que tem para vender uma vez que não sei se estará ou não relacionado com o facto das editoras terem um acordo com ele, gravam o disco, uh, tens direito a X cópias, depois fazes o dinheiro como quiseres. Mas ele é muito, muito ativo. Ah, voltando, voltando ao álbum, foi gravado uh, com um telemóvel e ele diz que não é o melhor, isso, melhor, é? Álbum ao vivo, melhor álbum ao vivo de sempre, mas foi todo remisturado e remasterizado. 
e, e é um bom álbum ao vivo, uh, segundo, segundo o Paul. Uh, portanto, pessoal, quando tivermos o link, o link vai ser colocado aqui e, <risos> e pode ser que consigamos ajudar o Paul a vender mais umas cópias, porque ele precisa de espaço. Já vou divulgar, vamos divulgar. Ok. É, é okay. isso, specmetal.net e aproveitar e, e conseguir as coisas diretamente do Paul. Já tive a oportunidade de comprar material de, de Master que até vem autografado, ele, ele tem esse, sempre esse cuidado de, de personalizar ao máximo o, uma venda, é, é, é muito interessante. Vou, vou agora perguntar ao Paul, porque é uma dúvida que eu tenho já, já há algum tempo, uh, questioná-lo sobre o que é que o levou a sair dos Estados Unidos e, e estabelecer-se na República Checa. E depois, a título de brincadeira, vou, claro que era, era impossível fugir a esta questão, uh, gostaria de saber se ele foi para, para lá, para a República Checa, para se tornar um diretor de cinema, uma vez que sabemos que na República Checa o cinema uh, traz muito X, digo eu. Uh, <risos> Paul, um, yes. back to English. Um, That's good. The next question is something that I, I always wanted to know, but never, never had the chance to know, so I can ask you personally, or, or almost personally, um, what took you to leave the States And, and settle in, in Czech Republic. And uh, I would like to know if you have some connections with the movie industry in Czech Republic, if you know what I mean. <laughs> the movie industry, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, the kind, that's the kind of movies that Miguel watches. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. I got you. I get it then, yeah. <laughs> uh, what happened was this... Um, When, uh, in 1999, I did a tour uh, with Malevolent Creation in Europe. It was uh, yeah, 99, I believe. Yeah, 1999. And uh, Vader was supposed to be the headliner or co-headliner with Malevolent Creation. And at the last minute, they canceled. So a band uh, came in called Kravathor from the Czech Republic. And uh, this is how I met the guys. And uh, like during sound checks and stuff in the afternoon, We would be messing around, me and the drummer, Skull, and I'd play bass, and he played drums, obviously, and we had a good time together, and and uh, after the, you know, there was like 44 concerts in 40, 49 days, maybe. It was really a long tour and crazy, and either you got to be friends with the band's members, you know, each other, or you killed each other. Well, obviously, on, on this tour, we became friends, and and after the tour, uh, the, the, uh, um, the bass player, Bruno, left, Uh, Kravathor had started his own band, Hypnos, and uh, this there was an opportunity for me to come to the Czech Republic and, and actually play with Kravathor. And they, uh, the guitar player Christopher, he called me and asked me if I would consider checking it out. So I, uh, I came out for like uh, um, maybe six weeks or something, and and I did some rehearsing and played some shows, and and then they uh, said asked me if I'd like to come out and try it for a year. So I came out and I pretty much never came, never went back. I mean, I went back to do some working in the beginning and, and, uh, we, you know, I did some touring over the years and stuff, but I never went back to live there. I finally, uh, came to the Czech Republic. And I, I don't know, maybe six weeks later. And then I just stayed here and I've been here ever since really. And I made a life out here. You know, Kravathor was, a, was a big help for me. And then, uh, You know, uh, I, I did like uh, probably a year of shows or something, uh, Japanese tour, di different stuff. And, and then uh, they in uh, 2003, they helped me do a, a master record as well. They actually played, the drummer and guitar player played with me as master. And uh, things started taking off again. And and I stayed here. And, and the, the reality is, is that I found more success in Europe than I did in the United States. People were more interested in Master and in me in Europe, and and obviously that was the reason why I stayed and why I'm still doing it today. I mean, I go back to America occasionally and tour and and have some successful shows. Don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying that I I got more respect in Europe. So obviously you're going to go where you get more respect. I mean that it, it worked for me. I made a living, made a life here, and and I'm still making a living at it. And 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 life is good. Ok, ok, that's it. And that was a mouthful, uh, sorry. <risos> uh, de facto, não há ligação ao cinema. Uh, os filmes que eu vejo nunca foram realizados pelo, pelo Paul. 
Já os do Barrote, se calhar, foram. <risos> Bom, um, o Paul uh, acaba por dizer que esta, esta ligação à República Checa acontece por uma consequência de eventos que foram acontecendo, nomeadamente o convite do Scrabathor para, para ele salvar uma situação numa turnê como a Leveland Creation, uma vez que os Vader não apareceram, e, e de repente entram os Scrabathor, o, o Paul está com eles, e... E a amizade acaba por acontecer. Uh, depois há a proposta também para, para permanecer na banda pelo menos durante um ano, ele acaba por se estabelecer, as coisas acontecem de forma positiva, o Paul sente-se confortável, acaba por, por fazer uma vida normal na República Checa, a ligação à Europa torna-se mais fácil uma vez que o Paul, com todo o respeito por vários lugares do mundo onde ele vai tocar, um, sente que o sucesso europeu é maior, logo a ligação à Europa torna-se evidente e acaba por se estabelecer na República Checa. Um, depois é interessante perceber que que ele um, tem ainda alguma ligação a, a outros países, nomeadamente os Estados Unidos, mas um, não é o suficiente para ele achar que, que, que se deve mudar novamente para, para aquelas bandas. Uma vez que, que a Europa o trata bem, temos pena, Barrote, não ser em Portugal, como o Jeff, não era como o Jeff Mantas, mas uh, tiver, tiveram os Crabathor a sorte de, de convidar o Paul para participar num trabalho e o desenrasco acaba por se tornar uma realidade e, e, e um trabalho que depois também acaba por contar com os membros do Crabathor para gravar Master. Uh, lá está, ajudam-se uns aos outros e os projetos do Paul são tantos que ele acaba por utilizar todos os conhecimentos que tem uh, nos projetos que, que faz. Uh, desta vez vou pedir ao Barrote para fazer a pergunta do, do Eric. Tens é que ligar o som, Barrote. Estás sem microfone, Barrote. A pergunta do Ivan, não é do Eric. A ah, do Ivan? É, o, Ivan, o, o Ivan está uh, no trabalho e mandou uma perguntinha okay. aí. Okay. E um abraço para o Ivan. Um, e um abraço para ele. Um ele, ele, ele o, Ivan, o Ivan e nós, que quer saber... Nós também, um, eu também quero saber. Uh, a, banda, a banda foi formada em meados dos anos 80, mas o primeiro álbum só foi lançado em 90, por, ele quer saber porque a demora uh, em lançar o primeiro trabalho. Uh, Paul, we have... Um, Another uh, friend of ours that is not here today because okay. he is still at work, but yeah. he managed to send a question that he wanted to ask you and he wanted to know uh, why is it that despite the band being, um, was, uh, being born uh, in the mid 80s, uh, they, you only released your first uh, record in 1990. So why the delay? Why the delay? We couldn't find a, a record contract after the first one. Uh, we were offered a contract by, uh, what was it, Combat Records. And this was uh, in the early Combat days. Combat Records. Yeah, in the early days. And this was when uh, when they, uh, they didn't know what they were doing. They weren't offered much money, for one thing. You know, It, it was a new genre, whatever you want to say. New music, heavy, aggressive. They were taking a chance, but they were offering peanuts for it. And uh, well, I think that's a good question. <laughs> it was a long time ago, you know. And uh, we got this uh, contract from them, and and as I said, it was a joke. There was no money really involved. Uh, Don K from Brooklyn College Radio put us on uh, on the radio, live on the radio. We got escorted out by the police. It was in the early '80s, okay. <laughs> it's courted by the police <laughs> uh, yeah yeah because we were swearing on the radio you know brooklyn college radio we were young we didn't know what the hell we were doing you know we drove the car to new york and next thing you know we're on the radio we're swearing and saying bad things and they kicked us out of the out of the station okay. but, but uh we had a record contract shortly after that and like i said uh they really didn't offer a lot of money and we didn't know what we were doing and and uh We had this famous guy, uh, a producer. Uh, he just happened to be uh, getting a haircut in the studio one day. His name was uh, Kim Fowley. He was like uh, the manager from the Runaways, and 
He wrote songs for Kiss and Alice Cooper. He was really a famous guy at that time. He was uh, the producer of Casey Kasem's radio show. This is a long time ago. This is the early 80s, like I said. And he charged me like a dollar a minute to read this this uh, combat contract. Okay. Uh, combat records. Anyway. And uh, what he did was uh, he charged me a dollar a minute and he turned this record contract into a multi-million dollar contract. <laughs> well, you know, combat looked at that contract and threw it in the garbage. So... Uh, Nothing happened then for many years. It took like maybe five years before we got some interest again. Um, I happened to be uh, traveling. Uh, I went to the woods, this, this woods area, wooded area, after I was done moving furniture that, this particular afternoon. And me and my friend, we would go there and have some beer after the, you know, after work. I was moving furniture, working really hard, busting my ass. And we would go out there and drink a few beers and then go home. Well, uh, a couple of Harley Davidsons uh, happened to pull up, and and this uh, guy uh, from school, I remember, Paul Ninos, he was there, and this other uh, semi-famous guy at the time, Joe Caper, he also uh, was on another Harley, uh, Righteous Pigs, Joe Caper, this guy, and uh, oh. and at the time, uh, I had this. We had just done this uh, Abomination demo in 1987. It was the Red Demo, and uh, I happened to. You know, I would walk around with these demo cassettes in my pocket, you know. It was like a dream, you know. Maybe I'd meet somebody or something would happen, or I'd, I'd give you a copy, you know. And, and well, Joe Caper's like, Paul, you know, uh, with Righteous Pigs, we just signed a deal with this new label called Nuclear Blast Records. And, uh, you know, maybe I could turn them on to you guys. I mean, you're a legend, Paul. You know, he said, oh, you know, I, I saw you with Master and with Abomination and the Funeral Bitch and all these different bands and, Oh, it's great to see you again. He shook my hand, and I said, well, I just happened to have this cassette in my pocket, you know. And I gave it to him. And within a week, I got a record contract, you know, from Nuclear Blast for Abomination. And then uh, because uh, Mitch Harris from uh, Napalm Death, also Righteous Pigs at the time, he told uh, the guys at the label that they should also look into this band Master and maybe Death Strike too. Well, a week later, maybe 10 days later, I got another contract. For master, and this is how it all really began. Okay, this is a long time ago, you know, but this is how it all really began. You know, there was a, a a long period of time after that first contract was thrown in the garbage where I was just struggling and really just trying to figure out what to do. And uh, then uh, we put together Funeral Bitch for a short time, and that that was in '87, and then uh, Abomination in '87 and '88. And then in 89, I got this deal for Abomination and Master as well. And, and pretty much the rest is history. A lot went on for the next few years after that. And then it fell apart again. But anyway, I never stopped fighting. <laughs> that's yeah, why I'm that's, still that's the key. Yeah. That's the key. But, yeah, but yeah. Uh, it's, it's a great story. So, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just saying, I never, I never gave up. I mean, that's why I'm still doing it today. You know that. Okay, this COVID thing has got me depressed and freaking me out and everything, but I'm I'm still ready to go as soon as I can, <laughs> you know? Yeah, we all are. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure everybody is. I cannot imagine how, how the first show after all this is going to, to be. I, I think I will be dragged home. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> I mean, there are shows going on in the Czech Republic and stuff, but... Uh, I'm not playing concerts because my band members are in the USA right now, and it's uh, not really possible for me. And you know, at the moment, I don't want to rush to rush to uh, put together a lineup and until I really know what's happening. You know, they offered for me yeah. to play uh, play the Obscene Extreme like a month ago, and I, didn't, I had to turn it down because I didn't have a band. You know, Punch and Stench was the headliner. Well, it was first offered to me. But I had to say no because I didn't have a band, you know. So I'm waiting uh, for details on this tour next year in March. And as soon as I get a yes, like some tour dates, I have the first festival. But then I'll, uh, I'll, I'm waiting to see what happens in America, if they're ever going to let Americans fly here again or not. And if not, then I'm going to have to put together a European, European band again. And I will. I mean, there's plenty of guys out there. I'm sure I can find members if I have to. Of course, yeah. I'd rather use the guys that are in the band now. 
but time will tell. You know, life is going to go on, and I'm going to continue either way. You know, no disrespect to my, you know, my members in America. I'm hoping they can come here, but right now it doesn't look good. You know. No, no, the situation is not getting better. Uh, well, anyway, uh, leaving uh, depressing stuff aside, <laughs> yeah, let's yeah. talk about the metal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. You got it. <laughs> um, longa resposta. Longa resposta. Vai tentar simplificar uh, isso aí, bicho? Uh, isto basicamente é, são coisas... Uh, há quem diga que são coisas do destino. Andar com uma, com uma cassete da no demo bolso. no bolso e encontrar as pessoas certas uh, que na altura estavam a tocar numa banda chamada Righteous Pigs uh, de, e que tinham acabado de assinar um contrato pela Nucla Blast, na altura em que a Nucla Blast era uma editora uh, de jeito <risos> isto uma à parte e, e a começar e, praticamente e, e, ter, e ter um empurrão por parte dessa banda uh, para que assinassem um contrato e depois também para assinarem um contrato com o Master e também assinarem um contrato com Death Strike e tudo isto porque tinha uma cassete no bolso e estacionou o Marley Davidson com um dos membros dessa banda à frente dele, que o reconheceu, falaram, toma lá, toma lá a demo. E o foi, o Mitch é... Harris, foi o Mitch Não, Harris, não é? Foi o Mitch, o Mitch Harris, uh, foi quem falou com, o, com a Nuclear Blast, mas quem, quem o encontrou e a quem ele deu a tape foi o outro membro da banda, Righteous Pigs. Uh, portanto... Excelente, excelente a história. E Isto é um, ele bom recado, é um bom recado para, para aqueles que têm bandas e que estão a começar para trazerem consigo sempre alguma coisa. É para e nunca um... desistirem. E nunca o físico. E nunca Never desistirem. give up. Yes. É verdade. <risos> Never give up. Because you have some hard times, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Paul, you are, that, you, are guy, up, you are a guy that ups walks. And downs. You are a guy that walks in the woods. Often, I, I see your posts in, in Instagram, and uh, yeah. last time I saw you, you were grabbing mu mushrooms. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this yeah. this is the, the way to live. That was yesterday. Yeah, this is the way to live. So you go, you go the best natural way to the to, you know, enjoying Earth as it is. Hopefully, yeah. the the weather is, is getting you know uh, maybe. A little bit obscure uh, to your way. Uh, I don't know if summer is almost ending over there, but um, it seems that it is um, hot everywhere in Europe. So even in Siberia, the the, the weather is changing. Yeah, uh, are you are you a guy with uh, you know with some ideas about nature events? Uh, and do you have um, a personal? Uh, um, idea of what's going on do you think this is a cycle do you think this is man-made what do you think about this subject uh, i think it's uh i think it has, i think it's a cycle i think it, it has a lot to do with it right now the strange weather has a lot to do with the covid and how there's not so many airplanes just my opinion there's not so many airplanes there's not as much pollution as before and and now uh The earth is saying, wow, what's going on? And now it's throwing all kinds of crazy stuff at us. Because uh, it's a good thing, obviously, the pollution's down. We know that. This is a good thing. But uh, it seems as the earth is not uh, handling, uh, uh, responding very well. I don't know. It's like uh, uh, in Czech and Slovakia, uh, if you would have said tornado, you would have been people would laugh at you. But uh, there was a tornado here a month ago. There was a tornado last week in Slovakia. These these tornadoes were only in the USA, as far as I know. And now they're now they're in Europe as well. So uh, the atmosphere is changing. I don't really have the answer. I'm not a scientist, you know. And uh, we've been going through a dry spell here. Um, last year, so this is why I'm a little confused. But last year it was raining, and I had gone. Uh, And found mushrooms like four or five times already. Uh, this year, the first the first day I went for mushrooms was yesterday. It was the first time we had enough rain that maybe I would find some mushrooms. And uh, I, we went, I went with my wife, and I think together we found like 11 mushrooms. And um, let's say a year ago, around the same time, I probably would have found a hundred. 
So th- I, I really don't know what's happening, but but here we're having a dry spell and it's strange. But you know, you, there's not so many planes flying over over my house anymore and stuff. The, the atmosphere's changed, I guess. I really don't know. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Been, but question. it's glad to know that. Yeah, uh, that was a good question, but I really don't have the answer. Okay, Paul. Uh, but um, the only thing that matters is that is that you 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 care for 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 nature, and yeah. you go out and you see things. What's going on when you are looking for something from from Earth? You know, yeah. uh, to t- to grab from 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 the land, and uh, it's a bit worrying uh, what you are talk- telling us about the few mushrooms that you you had the chance to find because. Yeah, I'm wondering what's happening. Yeah, I'm wondering what's happening. It's, it's a little yeah. confusing for me, for sure. I'm sure everyone feels the same way. There's fires everywhere. Last year as well. I don't know. You know, it's like floods in China and you know different places, and you know we're totally under a dry spell and. And, uh, you know, the grapes and all, and a lot of the things are are struggling. A lot of the fruits, you know, are not like the fruit in my backyard. The the tree, uh, the fruits are smaller this year. We didn't get enough rain. You know, usually the peaches are really big, and this year they're really small. So, it, obviously, it's the rain, but I don't know. I think everybody's being affected, you know. I'm hoping that uh, things, things get better, but then on the other hand, you know, we don't need more pollution either. <laughs> so it's a catch yeah. 20, 22, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, indeed. Um, eu questionei o Paulo sobre, sobre o ambiente e sobre o que é que ele acha sobre o, o que está a acontecer com o clima, porque as mensagens, uh, muitas vezes nas músicas, também estão relacionadas com, com, com o clima, com o ambiente, com as preocupações uh, de tudo o que está à nossa volta e... e e, e não podemos pôr de lado tudo aquilo que está a acontecer nesta altura no mundo, não é? Uh, o Paul, uh, de alguma forma, uh, acha que poderá ser um ciclo, no entanto, uh, sente que o facto de haver menos poluição uh, trouxe alguma esperança, mas a, o planeta parece que não está a reagir da melhor forma, e com isso uh, ele diz que nota na Terra, não há chuva, um, há tornados em lugares que nunca se imaginou, um, e, e por outro lado a terra não está a dar aquilo que, que se esperava um, e, e contudo ainda se nota uma, uma mensagem de esperança olhando para o futuro e achando que as coisas poderão melhorar assim esperamos que aconteça vamos pôr a pergunta do, do Eric a pergunta que ele nos deixou Jorge uh, ou ele ainda vai entrar e avançamos para a seguinte tens que ligar o microfone é, eu vou fazer porque eu acho que ele se atrasou aqui ele okay. pergunta para o Paul, basicamente, como é o processo de composição, né? como, ele, como ele compõe, considerando que ele né, que o, que, que tem uma, uma grande e vasta aí discografia, né? se ele tem alguma dificuldade, enfim, de, de, de não estar não, não, não tá seguindo uma fórmula pronta, é basicamente em cima de como ele compõe, se existe essa preocupação por parte dele de, né, de não estar tá se repetindo. Né? Basicamente é essa linha aí, Miguel. Ok, um, eu vou, vou, vou avançar com, com esta pergunta, uma vez que a seguir é o Barroto que vai trazer uma pergunta. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Paul, um, we have a friend that uh, should be here with us online, Eric, yeah. um abraço para ti, um, and he's asking that, um, you know, he's very interested to know how do you uh, work out your, your sounds, uh, how do you... How do you um, work your compositions um you know once that um you have this biggest and long uh, discography you would like to know the the if you have a formula to to, yeah. to write new material yeah it's right here um i got the acoustic guitar behind me obviously and uh normally i'll just uh let me grab a pick here I'll just mess around like normal people. And maybe. Yeah, I'll just like write a riff and and then uh, I'll record it on that little recorder and mess around with it and, you know, and try and, uh, and, and, try and write a song. I, I, uh, I pick up the guitar once in a while, you know, maybe once a month, I'll pick up an acoustic and and uh, mess around and just try and come up with a riff. And, um, 
usually the riffs just come to me. And then uh, it gets to the point where I record like maybe three or 400 riffs over a year or two. And then when it comes time to, to do a record, I listen to the riffs. And, and let's say out of the hundreds of riffs or whatever, maybe there's 10 songs in there, you know, a bunch of it's crap. But, but then other times it's like uh, I'll listen to it again later and then I'll realize that I missed the whole song because I just didn't grasp what it was, you know. Like you listen to this little micro cassette recorder and sometimes you just don't grasp the, ri the riff, you know. And, and later on, sometimes even five years later, I'll, I'll, I'll hear something and I'll go, wow, what the hell's that? And I'll listen to it and, and I'll turn it into a song. And then uh, from there... Uh, I write lyrics. I usually write the lyrics when the music's finished, you know? I mean, I usually write the music first, and then I'll write lyrics. And again, the lyrics just come to me, and you ho I hope for the best, you know? Sometimes I rewrite them. Sometimes I don't like a, like the way the lyrics are in a song, and I'll just scratch the whole thing and start again. Like, for the last uh, several years, I've been doing a lo lot of uh, records with uh, uh, Joe Hansen. You know this uh, Johansson Spectrum project, Rogo Johansson, and and what he does is he uh, he gets together with a drummer, and then he writes a whole record for me. He plays the drums and the uh, the guitar and the bass, and then the drummer does the drums, obviously, and then he'll send me a uh, whole album finished, and then I have to uh, I have to write lyrics and go to the studio and sing it. And this is we've been we've done this like five times, and and uh, the sixth one will be coming out probably next year or in the fall of this year. I'm still waiting. It's called Beneath a Bleeding Sky, the sixth recording. But but uh, it's also a challenge, too. And I like these challenges as well because it's somebody else writing the music. So it's more interesting and actually at times more difficult for me to figure out how to phrase the lyrics on someone else's songs. But the reality is is that I find this a challenge. And, and a lot of times... Uh, it comes out great. Like I did this uh, Cadabric Poison record also some years ago. And uh, same thing, the, the, the guys just sent me some music and said, hey, can you write some lyrics and sing for me? And and that record also came out excellent. So it's, a, it's actually a nice thing to have other people send you music and you, ca you come up with the ideas yourself and you put it together and then you send it to them and you go, oh, do you like it or you don't like it? And, Okay, they like it because I, I do a good job, you know, but they're sending me good music. So this is also a fun thing as well. So anyway, basically for me, going back to what we said, it usually starts on the acoustic and the micro cassette recorder and we go from there. I used to have that, uh, actually, I said it wrong. This is, this is the digital here, but I used to do it on the micro cassette recorder too. So I've got maybe 30 or 40 of these little tiny cassettes from back in the day with riffs on them too. And again, when I'm doing a new album, sometimes I'll discover a small part of a song or a whole song there as well. It's like when you, when you record the stuff, sometimes you, you think it's great and it sucks. And then other times you, you miss something or something that uh, you weren't sure about ends up being a great song on, on your next record. I hope that wasn't too much, but that's how I do. No, no, no. It. I I believe that you have uh, maybe fifty records somewhere <laughs> to record with the, all those riffs uh, you have. Yeah, there. maybe quite a few. Anyway, I don't know about fifty, but quite a few. I would reissues for sure, but but actually, uh, ensure I that ensure that you have copies, hard copies of that, because you don't want to to, to lose those recordings. Like what are you do? <laughs> what are you going to do with those hard copies? I've got them, actually. But sometimes I think about it. What the hell am I going to do with the hard copies? What am I going to do with all the guitars and the basses? Obviously, I'm going to have to give them to somebody at some point, you know, when I get too old. <laughs> have, you, have, you ever, have you ever thought of writing music to others? Oh, you mean for other people? Yeah. Oh, I never tried that. I suppose I probably could, but I never really tried that. Nobody ever asked me to do that. They're only asking for for lyrics and vocals, you know. Nobody ever asked okay. me for a song. That's a good that's a good one. Maybe somebody will one day, but nobody asked me yeah, for a it's, song. It's the way it's a way to live. To, to well, earn I'm, your I'm, money. Well, I'm 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 living off the music. That's the one thing I will say. I am living off the music. That's you know? good. Not everyone okay. can say that. I mean, I mean I, my job is to go to the post office three times a week. I'll admit that. <laughs> Packaging, you know, 
making packages every day. Okay, but it's not such a bad job, and it doesn't take all doesn't take all day. It's not it's not a nine hour day work day. You know, doing you the packaging. Selling your, you are selling your product, huh? You are selling your product, so it's so it's, it's not really work. Then. Yeah, it's not really work then. Exactly, that's how I feel about it when I'm doing it. You know, okay. Sometimes I got a new shirt out and I got to make 60 packages, but still, I'm smiling when I'm making them. I'm putting them together. I'm smiling. You know, I'm like, okay, this is not so bad. And now I'm getting on my bicycle and riding to the forest or I'm taking my car to the studio or, you know, whatever. It's okay. You're right. It's not a bad job. <laughs> Wake up in the morning and, and smiling because uh, you are doing what you like. It's like, it's no job at all. I wake up. I'll tell you. I wake up in the morning. I I walk the dog. It's, we usually do a small one in the morning, maybe like uh, you know, ten minute walk or something. And he comes back, and and then uh, I you know I brush my teeth, no, like normal people do. I take a shower, do my normal morning routine. Then uh, I walk the dog again. This time for maybe twenty five minutes, yo. Then uh, I go to the gym. This is on uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for two and a half hours, and I really work out like a maniac, cardio, weights, and all kinds of shit. I really bust my ass. Then I come back, and I walk the dog again, a short one, maybe 10, 15 minutes. I have lunch. And not every day, but nearly every day, I'll take a nap then for like an hour. Then uh, I'll go to the post office. Then I'll, I'll come back. I'll have coffee. And then I'll play the bass for an hour or pick up the guitar and then start working on dinner. And then the wife comes home. That's my routine usually. You know? It's not a bad life, okay? No, That's it's a perfect life. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know? it's the, the best way to live it. Uh, yeah. Let me translate this a bit. Um, yeah, I know. Sure I it's a lot there. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so you can learn some Portuguese. There you um, go. Nós temos aqui então um método, uh, é o Paul Speckman Paul Formula, que é, que é então um gravador que sempre o acompanhou com centenas de riffs que ele já tem uh, gravados e que vai guardando cada vez que pega na guitarra acústica. Ele, ele falou que pelo menos uma vez por mês se senta a gravar umas coisas e depois fica ali tudo gravado. Às vezes, uh, quando, quando chega a altura de trabalhar um novo álbum, ele vai ouvir os riffs, vai juntando, umas vezes gosta, outras vezes volta mais tarde a ouvir coisas que não gostou e até já, já está mais virado para aquele lado. E assim se vão juntando as músicas de todos os projetos que o Paul tem. Por outro lado, ele também gosta muito de trabalhar com outras pessoas, uma vez que às vezes recebe convites para para escrever letras e também para colaborar com, com a voz uh, e diz que torna-se desafiante uh, trabalhar do, de uma forma diferente uma vez que são os outros que lhe estão a enviar a música e pedem a ele que, que, que entre naquele, naquele quadro para, para fazer um todo uh, depois uh, o Paulo acabou aqui por nos falar, falar um pouco da rotina dele que é precisamente igual a de qualquer um de nós mortais uh, acorda de manhã bem disposto, vai dar a volta ao, com o cão, depois regressa à casa, uh, almoço, depois vai para o ginásio, dá-lhe com força, depois também uh, mais uma volta, uma cesta quando é possível e é uma vida comum, como qualquer um de nós. Uh, o, o que ele destaca aqui é o facto de fazer aquilo que gosta, achar que tem uma vida boa e de facto não se pode pedir mais, ele está junto à natureza, está está em contato com, com, com o mundo, com a cena que ele, que ele se identifica e, e acha que ir aos correios vender o material que ele tem, não é que ele compõe e que ele produz, é um bom trabalho. Por isso, o Paulo acho que tem a vida. Ô Miguel, Sim. antes do Barrote, rapidinho, ele é um compositor, pergunta para ele rapidinho, qual é o melhor riff maker para ele no metal? Quero só ok, ouvir. Jay. Jay is adding a question, uh, asking you, in your opinion, what's the, the riff master of the world? Who's the riff master of the world? Oh, that's tough, Phil. Yeah. Um, I think Tony Iommi wrote a lot of good riffs. Oh. <laughs> I knew. I knew he wanted that answer. <laughs> that's what he wanted to hear. <laughs> yeah. For me, Tony Iommi wrote a lot of great riffs, you know? 
Okay. For us. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> Excellent. A lot of great black players. Resposta <laughs> certa. <laughs> I'm still listening. I you just, you just saved, you just together. saved yourself from being kicked out of this, of the live interview. Black Sabbath. <laughs> I love Black Sabbath. Oh, Jorge, já podes dormir descansado. Barrote, avança. Ora, vou avançar, mas vou para trás. Vou para trás porque já que falamos de, de Black Sabbath, se calhar vai estar também, vai fazer parte da, da, da resposta. Mas vou-lhe perguntar porque é que, o que é que o fez começar a tocar uh, heavy, uh, heavy music, vamos chamar música pesada, uh, e quais são as influências dele dentro e fora de metal. É muito importante ouvirmos de tudo. Um, Paul, yes. we already discussed this when we were offline, but we wanted to, to hear from you live. Uh, first, what made you uh, start playing heavy mu music and what are your okay. main influences both in metal and outside metal? Okay, let's see. So what made me start playing music? Uh, heavy music. Uh, yeah, when, when, uh, when high school began, um, I went to high school and there was a band called Deuce. It wasn't spelled the same way as the song Deuce from Kiss, even though I know they like Kiss anyway. But they were playing like Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath covers and stuff. I really don't know if they had originals or what, but these guys look cool. They all had long, long hair and stuff. And I was impressed by, you know, they're playing this heavy. They were playing Black Sabbath, like I said, too. And, and uh, after I saw these guys, for some reason, I just said, I want to be in a band. Okay. But it still wasn't for another year later until I was walking down the hall singing a song called uh, All Good People from Yes. That was a great band, too. Chris Squire and the band Yes. Excellent band. Anyway, so this guy heard me singing this Yes song, All Good People, and he said, oh, you know, we got this heavy metal or this hard rock, not heavy metal at that time yet, but this hard rock band, and we're looking for a singer, and maybe you want to come on audition. Well, that changed my life. This uh, guitar player in the band, he's still playing in a band called Thrust. They're in L.A. now. They're originally from Chicago. It's a heavy metal band. Posers Will Die was one of their one of their songs back in the day, but whatever. But the point is, is that he got me into it, and then uh, the band split up after a few years of playing, you know, small shows and stuff, and playing at school and whatever. He went his own way, and I went to this band, started a band with my friends called War Cry. And anyway, Black Sabbath was really influenced War Cry and bands like uh, Angel Witch and things like this. And then uh, I discovered Iron Maiden and stuff, and And started getting into that and Motorhead, obviously, and Venom. These bands changed my life. And then the next step was uh, GBH, The Exploited, Discharge, uh, Christ on Parade, MDC. These bands just made me crazy with heaviness, you know. And, and that's why uh, Master always had, has had that punk style as well, you know, with the D-beat. And this is really what got me into it. Now, outside of it, uh, I, I like bands like Yes. Like I said, yeah, I like uh, not everything from Yes, just some records. I like uh, ELP. Um, I like some of this old Ted Nugent. I got a big collection of different stuff. I like UFO. I like the early Scorpions. Not the commercial stuff, but the earlier Scorpions, you know. And um, What else? A lot of stuff. You, uh, uh, Thin Lizzy. I'm old, you know. I listen to really old stuff, you know, Deep Purple. Obviously, Rainbow with Dio is one of my favorite of all time. But but this, I'm, I'm an old guy, you know. I, I know there's other bands. I like this this early Twisted Sister, the first couple of records. Excellent as well. A variety of stuff, you know. That's all I could say. A variety of music, you know. I can't name them all. I'll be talking forever, you know. I like a lot of bands, you know. I like variety. Variety is the spice of life, and it's the same in music, you know. I agree with you. Okay. Um, you were saying outside was outside metal. You'll, uh, you mentioned a few. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I mentioned a few. Mais uma, uma, longa, uma longa história uh, do, do Paul uh, sobre o que é que o levou a tocar a música mais pesada. Uh, e basicamente sentiu-se inspirado quando viu uma banda de covers que tocavam covers de Led Zeppelin e Black Sabbath ele não faz ideia se eles tocavam músicas originais ou não mas também não interessa porque ele 
quando ouviu aquilo, inspirou-se e foi convidado uh, uma vez, estava uh, uh, a cantar uma música dos Yes e um guitarrista de uma banda de heavy metal uh, ouviu e convidou para fazer uma Vou audição com a banda. Yes. Pergunta se tem gravado isso, por favor. <risos> Paul, do you have do you have that recording of you uh, singing the Yes song? No, no, no. It was, <laughs> no, it was a recording. It was just me walking down the hall, you know. Yeah, my battery is just dying on my on my mouse, but it's all right. Keep going. <laughs> Pronto, e a partir daí a partir daí é a história é a história uh, influências é influências de bandas principalmente bandas daquela daquela altura uh, e daqueles géneros daqueles géneros musicais uh, muito muita influência do punk uh, GBH Discharge Exploited uh, etc muitas influências que ainda hoje se caracterizam o som de master um, e é isto muito bom. Então, a próxima pergunta é tua, JK. Falar do Brasil, né? O Master teve no Brasil, enfim, algumas, algumas, uma turnê, algumas passagens bem emblemáticas, né, cara? O que, que ele lembra do Brasil aí? E aproveitando, fazer um gancho, né? Turnê, show, né? Qual a expectativa, né? Falar um pouco do Brasil e falar qual a expectativa aí. Para tocar já, no já mencionou, já mencionou que isto agora, só a partir do ano que vem, é que vamos começar a ver como é que é, mas podemos, é, podemos não, mas expect, não, expectativa não, não tem nenhuma, então, <risos> expectativa <risos> não tem nenhuma enquanto essa porra aí não resolver, né? Então, lembranças do Brasil aí, que, o, que, que eu, inclusive, eu estava em São Paulo no show do, do Master, foi, foi bem intenso e eu só tenho boas lembranças, queria saber se o Paul também tem. Ok, Paul, uh, Jay would like to, to ask you, you know... Uh, master having so many fans in Brazil, what can you recall from from those uh, those dates that you you made in Brazil? He was uh, mentioning that he was in uh, he was in in São Paulo uh, watching a master show. What uh, what do you remember from those days? Uh, those, those shows in São Paulo, most of the time, were festival sh festival shows. Those were great. The people were crazy, um, enjoying the music. I was having a good time. Uh, the, the last uh, the last few times, uh, Edu from uh, Nervo Chaos brought us out there, and every time we had a great time. He, he's the king, yo. Last time he brought me out there, and and the guys in, in Master was in uh, 2018, and this was a great tour. I think we had like I, I don't know 18 to 20 shows, and the first time I was in Brazil was in 2010. I think we had like 22 shows in seven weeks. So basically, we were just playing on the weekends and driving and staying in people's houses. But I want to say the, the one thing that I liked about that tour in 2010 is you really got to see the country. Oh, you're you're staying at people's houses for four days off and then you're driving for 20 hours or something, you know. But the point is, is that you really got to see the see the see the culture and, and meet the people and hang out with people. And we had a lot of fun, you know. Okay, okay, for sure. The last time it was 18 shows in, in 2018. I think 18 shows in 20 days. Okay, that was better in the sense that you're moving. You keep moving, you keep moving, you know. The other, in 2010, it was long and drawn out, and it was hell for the guys in the band. I know that, okay. It's much easier to go on tour and keep playing every day. But I'm just saying I enjoyed both tours, yeah. Because, like I said, the first one was cool because you got to see the world more. And the second one was cool because it was boom, boom, boom. And going back to São Paulo, I love playing São Paulo. I hope we get to play a festival there again one day, of course. You know, it's a dream to come back. I'm waiting for everything to clear so we can go there. Ok, ok. Jorge, tens aí a resposta. Já, já, já há esperança para o futuro. Basta que, que as coisas comecem a abrir. Que o Paul tem todo o prazer e, e está, está com muita vontade de regressar ao Brasil e conta histórias de, das, das turnés que teve no Brasil, nomeadamente uh, as, as tours que, que levam a percorrer o país e a conhecer o país, a fazer às vezes viagens de 20 horas, porque o Brasil de facto é, é enorme. Uh, isso não aconteceria em Portugal, o nosso país é pequeno, uh, mas, mas cheio, de, cheio de alma. É? Barrote é pequeno, ah! cheio de alma. 
É. Mas podes, é. podes fazer viagens de 20 horas, fazes também o norte do sul quatro vezes. Verdade. E então o, o Paul lembra-se particularmente do período que fez a turnê com, com o Nervo Chaos e, e, e tornam-se amigos. É, é muito natural depois conhecer mais a cultura do país, estando com alguém que, que lhe pertence. Um, as turnés foram diferentes, houve uma que, que, que foi mais prolongada e, com, e mais pausada, mas depois houve a mais recente que foi sempre a batalhar, portanto foram cerca de 20 dias que eles andaram aí por, pelo Brasil com cerca de 18 datas e foi sempre a dar, portanto a cada dia que passa é um concerto, é cansativo, mas tudo, tudo se torna mais mecânico e, e, e eficaz. Lá está, está sempre com vontade de regressar. Um, eu, eu vou avançar agora para, para a minha pergunta. Deixa-me só, deixa só diz, diz. colocar aqui um parênteses para, já que estamos a falar de concertos ao vivo, uh, mencionar que o nosso amigo Nuno Miguel fez uma obra de arte que está espetacular, enviou fotografias para o Paul e que está a esperar ansiosamente para que voltem a Portugal para que lhe possa dar pessoalmente. Essa, essa obra de arte. Eu não sei se é possível, uh, JK, não sei se é possível mostrar. Deixa eu mostrar aqui. aqui. Então, já agora, passa essa mensagem em inglês para o Paul. Uh, Paul, um, you'll, you'll have in your messenger, JK sent you um, some pictures of, um, of a work of art that a friend of ours in Portugal uh, made specially for you. Okay. ok, and he wants to give it to you personally when you play Portugal uh, the next okay. time. So I just wanted to 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 make sure that you got the the um, the, um, the images, the photos that he that he took from the of the work art uh, uh, of the artwork, and I, I uh, it's very, it. very cool. I'll, I loved it. I'll, I want to check it later because every time, uh, for some reason, when I'm on these chats here, if I go over to Facebook right now. I come back and I won't see you guys anymore. It's a problem every okay. time. So, okay. So okay. People are writing me right now on on, face, on Facebook and I'm not answering them because I don't want to go through it again. You know. Well, I wish, I wish I wish that... I get back on and you know. I, okay. Sure I wish I, w I wish that kind of thing work with me with with uh, um, Miguel. Uh, it would be great to go to Facebook and not see him again. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Aí está o desenho. Olha. There you go. Ah, okay. Oh, wow. Look at that. Okay. Look at the master in the pestilence. Yeah, it's cool. Nice artwork there too. Yo. Yeah, I see it. Oh, yeah, look at that. Okay. It's getting bigger now. Yeah, yeah. That's killer. Nice. Nice work, Phil. Yeah. Cool. So this is expecting you on the, on your next uh, tour in Portugal. <laughs> okay, super. I'll be there hopefully soon. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, nice. Pergunta se ele vai dar guitarra junto. É. Vamos perguntar ao, ao Nuno Miguel. Vamos perguntar se ele vai dar a guitarra também. That's good. So, Paul, let's go forward. This is yeah. uh, my my last question. Um, okay. You know, have having been following you since the the eighties, um, just like thousands of uh, of guys around the world and. Uh, The idea I have is that you are one of the most cherished guys in the metal scene. Uh, now, let's imagine that um, um, I might be your next employer. So I'm looking for good and bad characteristics about you. Um, what do you think are your better and worse characteristics? And meaning, the meaning of this is why do folks like you so much? I think because uh, maybe because of my honesty and I want to say that and because I'm right there with the folks, you know, I'm a fan too, you know, of these other bands and I'm a fan of music, etc. cetera. And uh, I'm approachable. Okay. Maybe not in Colombia, <laughs> but, but in most countries uh, in Brazil, for sure. In Portugal, I'm, I'm approachable. Like in uh, Colombia and Chile, The people are crazy and out of hand. I need security there. Like, for example, uh, one of the shows in Colombia, I had to have uh, five security guards around me, walk me to the toilet and stand around me while I pee because the people were just too aggressive. And then walk me back like a, a barricade around me, walk me back. Eventually, what I did is I, I had the people come up for autographs and pictures 
one or two at a time, like a guy with his girlfriend or, you know, guy with his wife, one or two at a time would come up the stairs and take photos and I'd sign their records or whatever, because uh, they're too aggressive. They, it's like the Beatles or something. They, they want to rip my clothes off. You can see it. They're aggressive, you know, and they, or they want to punch you in the head for no reason. They're so aggressive. It's really strange. But nothing against Chile or, you know, or, or Colombia. I want to play there again, you know, okay. But I'm just saying in, in Brazil and Portugal, it's a different thing. People are more respectful, you know. Hello, Paul, how are you? Hi, hello, how are you? In some of these other countries, they're just really aggressive and they just want to jump on you. Five guys at a time. Uh, you know, I want a picture with you all at once, you know. It's like a mob. Uh, and they're grabbing that's you. Why, know, that's tight. why you are, you are going to the gym, getting ready. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting ready for the next tour. You're right. <laughs> for the next South American journey. You're right. <laughs> now, I'm just trying to keep alive, you know. I, um, just three years ago, I started working out again because it's just like uh, – uh, I want to be healthy, you know. I want to live. You know, I'm, I'm going to be 58 this year. I want to live another 20 years, and, and I probably will. We'll see. Knock on wood. But the plan is to live for a little longer and keep playing, you know. And it just seems to me that if you if you're not exercising, taking care of yourself, and taking your vitamins or whatever, you're, you're going to have a short life. I think. So it's only my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm, I could drop that tomorrow. No, no, no. But I'm just no. saying that I. I think that health is really important. And over the last three years, I've just been really trying to get better. Yeah. And we wish you all the best. Uh, you Thank know, you. a healthy life and, and long, long life. Yeah, we'll see. To give us, yeah. to give us your best. As, yeah, as I, I want to put out more records. So that, that's the point. The only way I'm going to do that is if I'm healthy. You know, the older you get, the harder it is to record the records. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, Aquilo que, que faz com que as pessoas gostem mais do, do, do Paul, portanto eu fiz a pergunta porque é que tanta gente à volta do mundo gosta tanto, tanto do Paul, um, questionei sobre as melhores características e as piores, uh, ele, ele mencionou as melhores, uh, foi, foi falando, adjetivando algumas qualidades dele e um, a destacar a honestidade que, que, que faz com que ele seja tão apreciado, também uh, é uma pessoa que nos concertos acaba por estar sempre presente, não, não vai lá só tocar e depois vai para casa, vai-se embora, está sempre com os fãs uh, e é muito fácil de lidar, portanto são todos os ingredientes necessários para, para qualquer fã se conseguir aproximar do Polo e de alguma forma se identificar com ele. Ele destaca aqui a loucura do, da Colômbia e do Chile em que ele precisa de dois, três guarda-costas para afastarem o mais possível os fãs desses países, porque eles são extremamente agressivos. É, é como ele dizia, é puxa camisola, é dar um murro na cabeça, essa do murro na cabeça que eu não percebi, mas é, parece que é uma realidade, ou seja, é, como quem diz, anda cá, que eu não sei o que é que fazer. Aqui chama de mata-cobra. Mata-cobra? É um murro, um murro na cabeça. No entanto, uh, <risos> Brasil e Portugal ficam bem cotados na, na linha do Paul Speckman. Ainda São bem. pessoas que uh, sabem comportar-se, cumprimentando o Paul e, eventualmente, falando com ele. O bom exemplo foi o que o Nuno Miguel fez, com, com esta, esta, esta artwork que ele, que ele tem guardada para o Paul. Uh, somos um país, uh, de facto, cheio de boa vontade e muito amistosos. Uh, no Brasil, qualquer dia, é o Eriquito que está a fazer também um artwork. Ele é um artista aí, ó. É, é. Boa, boa. Eriquito, tens aqui fria. a mensagem. Um, vamos, vamos esperar que tudo corra bem. Eu, eu, eu depois acabei por acrescentar que o Paulo, o ginásio faz todo o sentido, uh, porque ele tem que se preparar para os, uh, os vários concertos. As torneses estão para chegar, esperemos que sim, que seja rápido. E, e ele acaba por uh, achar engraçada a ideia do ginásio estar associado ao regresso à Colômbia e ao Chile. Uh, mas, na realidade, todos procuramos o quê? Uma vida saudável. O Paulo está quase nos 60. Ele quer viver mais, mais alguns anos com qualidade para poder presentear-nos sempre com grandes músicas e excelentes trabalhos, como tem feito com todos os projetos por onde ele, onde ele tem passado. Uh, uou, fantástico, fantástico. Vamos para, para, para a última pergunta, não é? Barrote, ainda temos tempo. vamos avançar e, e será a última de hoje. Finish. Será a última. Sim, vamos falar dos projetos, porque o Metal Archives uh, menciona uma data de bandas em que ele é dado como membro ativo, 
Uh, às vezes é verdade, outras vezes não é. é vamos tentar saber se, o que é que é verdade e o que é que não é. Uh, e também falar um bocado sobre o projeto a solo que ele tem, uh, que se chama Speckman Project. Uh, Paul, last yes. question. When we were researching um, for questions uh, to, to ask you, um, mm -hmm. I noticed that uh, Metal Archives, uh, the website, what Metal Archives, uh, lists you as a member of several still active uh, acts. Uh, Blunt Force Trauma, Cadaveric Poison, Johansson and Speckman, and Master, of course, as well as a solo project that it's called Speckman Project which, mm -hmm. according to Metal Archives, was resumed this year, in 2021. So uh, the question is, how much of this is true? Which projects are indeed still active from this list besides okay. Master? And what are the plans for the, for the solo project? Okay, Master is active, obviously, like you said. And uh, Johansson Speckman, we just finished a new album, like I said earlier in the interview. It's uh, called Beneath the Bleeding Sky. Yeah. It yeah. should be out in uh, a couple of months, I'm thinking. We'll see. And uh, yes, this uh, Emancipation Records is uh, releasing a new Speckman project number two. I just finished recording the vocals and uh, the mixes have begun this week. And that will be out next spring. So that's true. And all the other bands are, are not playing. Once in a while, I'll do a show, you know, like when, okay. when it was happening. Once in a while, I would do a show or two with Death Strike, which was just the master members at the time playing Death Strike songs or Abomination. I did I did a few tours with Abomination, just some shows, same thing, some festivals. Obviously, it's about money. You know that. You get a good offer if you're going to bring one of those old records out and play it live. I need money like anybody else. But on the other hand, it's also fun for me to play those old songs in the style that they were originally written which is also cool, and it's also good for the fans that never got a chance to see Abomination or Death Strike to see those songs live. So I think for everybody, it's a win-win situation. Ok? Yeah, ok, perfect. Portanto, algumas das bandas que o Metal Archives lista como ativas não estão ativas. Master está, obviamente. Uh, Johansson and Speckman uh, está, e ele já tinha falado sobre isso, e tem um álbum uh, prestes a ser lançado, no espaço de dois meses, mais coisa, menos coisa. Uh, e sim, o projeto a solo Speckman Project vai ter o Speckman Project 2, uhum. e será lançado uh, no próximo ano, e é verdade que uh, foi retomado esse projeto, que já tinha uh, um trabalho cá fora, já editado há alguns anos atrás. Um, portanto, é isto. Penso que ficamos é por bom, aqui, é já vamos sabermos 7, que... 8 minutos depois da hora. É bom sabermos que teremos ainda a possibilidade de ver o Paul a fazer concertos com, com temas de Death Strike, Abomination, Sim. bandas do passado, que, que ele acaba por, por dizer que não estão fechadas e, e, e dá a possibilidade de, de nós que ainda não tivemos essa oportunidade de vermos esses temas ao vivo, que seria para mim seria fantástico. Okay, that's it, Paul. Wrap. And uh, hey guys, excellent. It's, uh, I had a nice time, yo. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you for, for... Thanks for your time as well. Heavy culture. Have a good evening. Stay heavy. Yeah. Stay thank heavy and much, healthy. Guys. And, and healthy. Uh, healthy. I yeah. hope to. I hope to get in touch with you soon to buy some some records, some vinyl records from you directly because I, I already did it once and uh, you are the most trustful guy uh, over the web. So I invite everyone to to do the same and and look for for Paul Speckman on Facebook, on on uh, Instagram, and also uh, SpeckmanMetal.net. So Speck. it's very easy. Speck metal. Uh, it's uh, you know. It's it's always a pleasure to 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 see how you work and uh, all the best for you. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much, you guys. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Paul. Paul. It was a pleasure. All Galera right. que acompanhou, muito obrigado. Acompanhem, uh, se inscrevam no canal, se inscrevam no Instagram, nos procurem no Facebook. E é isso aí, galera. Obrigado, Marrote. Obrigado. Uh, Miguel, obrigado. E um abraço para o Ivan que não conseguiu estar tá aí. Abraço. Galera, abraço e obrigado.